CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. All right. It is 7.32 p.m. on Tuesday, November 12th, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I would first like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Venkat Holly. Here. Adam LeBlanc. Here. And Elaine Hoffman is traveling this week and is unable to join us. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, here on behalf of the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. And I don't believe anyone else from the town is joining us tonight. Um, then looking for the dockets this evening. So for docket uh, 3820 57 Ariel Street, uh, Jackie Lee and Fernando Carrero. Jackie's here. All right. Uh, Cliff Rober, surveyor um, for the project, is also here. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, next is docket 3822, 20 Pond Lane. They have requested a continuance in writing, so I don't anticipate they're going to be here. Um, next is 3824, 232 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, Lisa Cronin. Uh, uh, Mr. Mike Chair, uh, Michael Corey for the applicant is here. Great, yes. thank you. Ryan Cronin to represent Lisa Cronin as the landlord is here as well. Oh, great, thank you. And then uh, we have docket 3825 15 West Street. Uh, that applicant has also requested a continuance this evening, uh, so they will not be uh, heard tonight. So tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with the supplemental bill signed by Governor Healy on March 29th, 2023, which extended temporary provisions pertaining to the open meeting law to March 31st, 2025. The extension of these provisions allows public bodies to hold their meetings remotely by providing live, adequate, alternative means of public access to the deliberations. This meeting is being recorded and will be broadcast by ACMI. Members of the public who are participating via Zoom and who wish to offer public comment should be aware that they will be asked to provide their full name and address so that a complete public record of the meeting can be taken in accordance with state law. All participants of this meeting are advised that people may be listening to the meeting without offering public comment, and those people are not required to identify themselves. Any votes that are taken this evening will be conducted by roll call. All supporting materials have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territory today. Uh, just an, a note on our procedures this evening. Um, at the end of the discussion of each individual hearing, the board will vote to either continue the public hearing to a specific date to continue receiving testimony on the matter, or the board will vote to close the public hearing, ending the receipt of new testimony. The board will then proceed to the next item on the agenda. Over the coming days, the board will prepare a draft decision based on the testimony received and the discussions that took place during the public hearing. And that discussion will be voted, that decision will be voted on at the next available meeting of the board. Um, at the start of this meeting, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, board member Adam LeBlanc, who was apported, uh, appointed by unanimous vote of the select board to fill a vacant seat on the board. We are very glad to have the benefit of his experience with us here on the board as a full board member. So, Adam, congratulations on joining the full board. Look forward to continuing on with the board and uh, hearing all these wonderful cases. All right, thank you very much. Uh, moving 
quickly on to administrative items. Uh, these items relate to the operation of the board and as such will generally be conducted without input from the general public. Board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will be there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. So we do have only one um, administrative item before us this evening. Uh, this is the uh, proposed schedule of meetings for 2025. Um, this was posted to Novus um, and is available for viewing there. Uh, the schedule includes both all the hearing dates, but also the filing deadlines uh, for applications uh, in order to meet those uh, particular dates. Um, were there any questions from the board on any of those dates? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, well, my computer has just gone to showing my grandchildren, which is nice, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, I I wondered if it would be advisable to add a paragraph underneath thing, all, everything saying the board reserves the right to cancel scheduled meetings or add additional meetings in order to promote the efficiency of its adjudication and administrative processes. Because we do have a certain degree of flexibility, and I don't want to create the impression that somebody can necessarily count that on our actually meeting at every one of these dates. Sometimes we don't, and uh, and sometimes we add new dates for various reasons. So, I, the point of this this caution is just to make it clear that this is, I'd say, it's a little more than tentative, but a little less than absolutely certain prediction of when our meeting dates will be. I do not have an objection to that. This is the. Um... Just so it's aware that these are the dates listed in the, the paragraph that Mr. Hanlon had recommended, noting that um, that this is subject to change based on the the needs of the of the board, as stated by Mr. Hanlon in a more eloquent fashion. Um, I think we, unless there's any further questions from the board, I think we could um, accept a motion to. Uh, approve the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting schedule for 2025 as amended by Mr. Hanlon. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. DuPont. Go ahead and stop the share. So uh, roll call vote of the board responding yes or no. Um, Mr. DuPont? Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. The chair votes yes, that is approved. Uh, that brings us to the end of the administrative items on our agenda and on to the public hearings. Uh, before tonight's um, opening tonight's meeting for public hearings, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. Mm -hmm. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote to either continue or close the public hearing. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. The final vote on any matter before the board will be taken at a subsequent meeting once the written decision has been drafted and provided to the board. The decision will then be filed with the town clerk starting the 20 day appeal period under state law. After that time, the applicant may proceed with their building permit. However, under state law, no decision granted by this board shall take effect until a certified copy of the final decision has been filed with and recorded at the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds in Cambridge by the applicant. Um, so with that, as I had noted at the start, we do have two uh, public hearings this evening, which are had continuances required requested um, in writing uh, prior to the meeting. And so I will just uh, move quickly to those two items uh, so that we can put that into the record and then move on to the actual hearings uh, that are before us this evening. Uh, so with that, I will move on to docket 3822 20 Pond Lane. Um, the applicant has requested a continuance um, until the hearing date of December 10th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Um, so 
the chair will entertain a motion to continue public hearing for 3822 to Tuesday, December 10th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So roll call vote of the board responding yes or no to continue the public hearing on 20 Pond Lane. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Holly. Yes. Mr. LeBlanc. Yes. And the chair votes yes. That item is continued. Um, with that, I'll move on to item six on our agenda, which is uh, docket 3825 15 West Street. Um, in this case, the applicant also has requested a continuance. Um, they've requested a continuance until Tuesday, November 26th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. So unless there's any questions, I would accept a motion to continue public hearing for docket 38. Um, uh, oh, I copied the wrong date on that one, sorry. Uh, 3825 15 West Street um, until Tuesday, November 26th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Tupont. So roll call vote of the board responding yes or no to continue the public hearing for 3825. Mr. Dupont? Uh, yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Uh, Leblanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. That item is continued. Uh, so with that, um, we'll move back up the list uh, to item three on our agenda this evening, which is docket 3820 Ariel Street. Um, this was continued from an earlier evening, but we had received no testimony at that meeting. Um, and so this will effectively be the start of the, the hearing on this item. Uh, so with that, I would ask the applicant to please um, introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Uh, Cliff Rober for the applicant. Um, so, uh, well, first, Cliff Rober, my current address is 14 Hudson Lane and uh, former owner of Rober Survey, but currently still a land surveyor and working as a consultant. Uh, what the, um, the applicant is proposing is to uh, do two things. One is take off the existing front entry and add a covered porch across the uh, entire uh, front of the house, five feet. This does uh, go into the setback at 19 feet at the closest point. We are currently uh, at 22.8 feet, which is non-conforming. Uh, this is to allow uh, better access into the house, uh, protected from the snow and, and elements. Uh, the other thing we are proposing to do is to uh, take off the backside of the house and deck and, and put a two and a half story addition uh, in the backside. And also we are looking to uh, replace the, part of the second floor and attic area in the front to make it also a, a complete two and a half story building. So we are required to go here before you for those, the two reasons. One is uh, a, the non-conforming front yard setback to extend and, and continue that. And the second is uh, we have a uh, addition larger than, uh, Required amount. I I don't have the number in front of me. I believe it's seven hundred or seven hundred and fifty. We we are required to come in front of the board. Uh, I do want to point out in the uh, the the plan that was submitted to you. Uh, two things are happening uh, for the height of the house. We are going from, and I have my notes here, an existing height of twenty eight point three feet. And with the addition and the usable area in the attic, we are going to 33.1 feet. Uh, I will note that 
based on the uh, zoning, these distances are, are calculated from the top of curb height per the uh, zone, uh, the zoning bylaws, uh, since this is a lot that has less than an 8% slope. Uh, we then did calculate and verify that the basement, uh, current basement is not considered a story uh, since it does not meet the definition of a story based on the bylaw, the definition of story in the bylaws. The additional portion of the house that is being built will have, have a basement that has a greater depth. It will have two steps down. Since the usability of the existing basement is a very short, and this will allow more of a greater height in that back area for the basement. Uh, for those reasons, and to allow the applicants uh, to expand and be able to utilize the house and, and have, have the ability to stay in town are primary to them wanting to do this project. Uh, we look forward to any questions that the board may have in that regard. If you would like to have me go over anything else, I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, so I, I bring it back to the board to ask any questions they may have on this. Great, thank you, Mr. Rober. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the documents. Um, so this is the... This is the um, what the existing house looks like currently, yes. Yep. Uh, so the, the front elevation facing Ariel Street, um, the left side, right side, the existing rear elevation of the house. Um, and then this is the proposed new front elevation, um, uh, side facing the left side, rear, you can see see where the addition, this is the entrance below grade into the new. Um, Correct, it, it's being brought in. So there's accessibility through the basement to that rear portion of the basement. Um, and then the, the right hand side. Um, and then floor plan. So this is the foundation level. The small inset is the existing. Um, and then this is the proposed. And I will note that on the proposed, uh, the rear of it is the addition portion of the proposed. The front is the existing. No. And it appears there's an existing foundation wall in this location that is being removed uh, as part of the project. Yes. And then at the first floor level, upper floor level. And then once more, this is just the attic floor. The shaded portion is the portion of the attic floor with a ceiling, excuse me, with a, a clear height of seven feet or greater, which is what counts towards a half story. Uh, so this is here to demonstrate that the house is compliant with the definition of a half story. So the attic floor um, is compliant. Correct. Yeah, and then we're back to where we were. Um, and then I did just want to quickly go over the site plan as well. Um, so this is the existing site plan. Um, existing house, the deck with a patio underneath on the rear that's being removed. Um, this addition, the back portion here that's being modified of the existing house. Um, and then at the very front, uh, the steps leading up to the front of the house are going to be removed. And then uh, the proposed plans um, shows the extent of the new addition, uh, which is compliant with the side yard setbacks. Um, this, uh, there's usable open space remaining in the rear um, around the proposed deck. And then at the front, there's the covered porch um, and there's usable open space in the front yard as well. Um, 
Uh, I would and like so to as I would like to have the board note that the left hand side of the addition uh, of left hand side of the house, which is the right hand side of the plan, has an existing setback of seven point six. However, the addition is 8.8. .8. That is less than the required, but it, it is more than the existing. Okay. Thank you for thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, and I might note that that left hand side uh, of the house it's going along the existing original. Um, original house in the back that is being taken down. So we're not looking to go closer than the original house in the front or the addition portion in the rear. Okay. Um, and I believe there's no changes to the existing parking on the site that will remain exactly as is? Yes, sir. Okay. Are there questions? I'm going to go ahead and stop the share on this. Are there questions from the board? Mr. Char? Mr. LeBlanc. Um, I wanted to address uh, partly the memo from the town, but also I kind of observed this as well when I was looking at the drawings of just the the window placement around on the, the building. Um, sure. I can. <clears throat> let me go. Go back to the, and reshare the house plans. Yes. I think specifically this left elevation here that that you're showing, um, it just seems like there could be some some window alignments that could be made better to fit with the residential design guidelines. Um, I think would be helpful. You know specifically. Um, you know, if we look at the part of the elevation closest to the front of the building, you know, there's the two first floor windows that don't quite line up with the basement windows and the windows on the second floor also don't quite uh, line up um, in some seemingly rational way. Um, so I, I, I would appreciate if something like that could be addressed. Um, you know, part of what the residential design guidelines mention is that window placement should be a function of kind of exterior looks and not necessarily what the floor plan is doing. Mm -hmm. um, so aligning those windows kind of follows that um, meaning of the design guidelines. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Mr. Panlin. I wonder, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm not sure that everybody in the meeting has uh, actually seen the uh, the letter from uh, ah. the town, which was only done today. And maybe if the chair could just remind everybody of what it says, would, would, would everybody put all of us in the same position of understanding what this issue is? Okay. Where do... So this is the planning memo um, from Ursula, who's the, um, the senior planner. Um, the first paragraph is just noting uh, review what the review was. And then the second paragraph is the main portion of this, that the applicant may want to review building out elements, principle C1, specifically roof and roof lines and window sections. Proposed gable dormer on the right side appears to lack the same level of roof detailing, i.e. eave returns as the front and rear facades. Similarly, the architectural plans show overly complex window combinations on the left elevation. Applicants should reduce the variety of different windows used. The residential guidelines encourage projects to establish a clear logic for the placement of windows of varying sizes and design and to have windows on adjacent floors relate to each other in some way. So with that, I was gonna go back to the plan. Um, so this is on the, let me go back to the, yeah, so this is on the first floor. So um, these are the, the two first floor windows, um, which their position appears to be set so that it is centered on the family room on the interior. Um, whereas the basement windows are existing um, 
relative to the overall length of the house. And then on the second floor, um, we have these two rooms in the bedroom. It appears that this window here might have some ability to be relocated. Um, this other window here in the bathroom does appear to be fairly locked into place. Um, going back to that elevation, if these two windows were to shift towards the front, what would be the implication on the interior? Um, we basically put this window here very tight to the wall of the office um, and basically shift the weight of the family room closer to the front of the house. So one of the things the board will have to consider is whether that um, is something that the board wants to um, impose as a part of the uh, the decision on this project um, as we think forward. The other piece that was in the notice was in regards to um, the eve details. Uh, so the front. Uh, has some very nicely detailed um, eaves, as does the rear, uh, but the side does not. Um, I think partly that is a a function of the change in roof pitch that the the dormer on the side has a significantly different pitch than the uh, the dormers facing the excuse me the gables facing the front and rear. Um, but if that's something that the board felt um was important we could certainly request that the the eve end treatments on the right side of the house match those treatments on the front and rear of the house and i believe that's the the basic extent of what was requested in the memo um it's gonna be seen on this side there's better alignment between some of the windows um especially here on the rear facade. Um, and the, the front is much better composed. It's just this side, this uh, left elevation here that has some issues. Excuse me. So I'll go ahead and stop the share again. Um, are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. LeBlanc actually asked a question, but we haven't really heard from the applicant about what they think about that. And I'm not quite sure who is here to, is is prepared to address it, but um, if there's a discussion to be had, they ought to be able to respond a little bit before we go on to the next thing. Yeah, this is uh, the the homeowner, and I'm I guess I'm not 100% clear on is because it that just came in this afternoon, so we haven't had a chance to discuss it with um with our contractor Fernando. Mm -hmm. Um, is it a require? We thought that this meeting was the trigger for the front and then the 750 square feet, but not necessarily landing on all the design elements like the window. So we weren't really prepared for that. Is that a requirement of this meeting or is there opportunity to reflect on that? Because I think mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just new, right? We'd have to kind of look through it. No, understand, understandable. Uh, so the town adopted residential design guidelines several years ago um, and the guidelines are a part of the review process. They're referenced um, on the as you go through the application process, there's a question on there specifically as to whether the residential design guidelines have been reviewed as a part of the, the design process. Um, they were put in place by the town to provide some, some level of guidance to applicants as to things they may want to consider as they are proposing um, changes to their homes um, and specifically sort of encouraging um, compliance with uh, certain aspects of design that are tend to be present more readily in different parts of the town, specifically the, the parts of the town where the um, 
where the home is located. Um, and so that is, that's where this review memo from uh, planning came from. Um, the, so I, certainly the board would encourage um, some thoughts along if there are things that can be done, uh, what could, you know, what would be um, readily achievable. I see that Mr. Carrera is, is, is on the call as well. Um, that we might be able to do that would address some of the some of these concerns, um, but we also, um, you know, understand that there are certainly there are other issues that uh, may not be readily um, uh, that might not readily be able to be incorporated, depending on on you know how the how the use of the house is is being considered. Is, is can it? Oh, I'm sorry. Can it? Can you guys hear me? I just I've been. We can't. Sir, why if you yeah, just introduce okay. yourself. Yes, uh, Fernando Carrero, owner of Valenti Contracting. How's everybody hey, doing? Mr. Chairman, before Please. Mr. Carrero goes, could I just make one procedural thing? Sure. Because I don't really want to put the applicant or their, or their con contractor into a position of having to make up the design for this house uh, on the spot before we, before we adjourn the meeting. So in response to Ms. Lee's question earlier, it certainly would be possible if they wanted time to discuss this and to think through how it is that they might be able to address the concern that's been raised by the, by the planning department. Um, we have a meeting coming up in the 26th, and if they want that time, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't provide it to them. I understand that it's a little hard to adjust to deal with a new issue that you first learned about within a few hours of going to the hearing and probably haven't had a chance to discuss with your advisors. So, you know, Mr. Karoche could should say what he wants to say, but um, it, it seems to me that it's not necessary for them to make a decision tonight unless they want to, uh, that they do have some time to think it over and we'd be happy to accommodate them in doing that. Absolutely. Well, I think we would be anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we're trying to get, the board to make a decision as soon as possible because these folks are looking to remodel their house. They have to move out. So um, we're, we already actually missed the last date. Um, mm -hmm. So we're on this one now, but we've been working on this design now for over two years and being a home that is very small as it is placement of windows, doors, whether it's interior, exterior, we went from, gliding doors to the back to regular doors in the back, back to gliding doors, you know, to accommodate their everyday use of the house and how furniture would be laid out, whether it's bedrooms, living room, family rooms, these were the best placements, especially that they work from home a lot and mm -hmm. home offices are very important to them. And so, you know, some of the windows ended up being a little bit smaller and not aesthetically pleasing from the outside as I would want, but it, it every time we try to place furniture, it just never seemed to work out. And that's why they ended up in where they are today. Um, we could definitely recommend some tweaks to placements and sizes of windows to try to play around with a little bit more with the design. But again, please you know, mm -hmm. understand that we have tried numerous times and a lot of design of back and forth. And this is what we felt like was the best layout and window placement for the homeowners to enjoy every single space of their home. Great, thank you for that. You're very welcome. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair? Mr. LeBlanc. Um. I just wanted to address the front porch issue that's also before us. Okay. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the what they're requesting with this, that the front porch, I think, aligns with generally what we're usually allow or consider for kind of a front yard porch. Um, and I think it adds a nice aesthetic to the house um, and helps with the, the look on on it as well. So I think it's worthwhile considering that. Um, the one thing I do want to point out is on the second floor, um, the bedroom wall is actually coming out and creating a 
extension um, on that. And I was just curious what that dimension was. So I know there's a section in the bylaw about um, exterior walls projecting past the exterior wall. There is 12 inches. 12 inches. So that wall yeah. is going to go 12 inches. Correct. Okay. It's just not dimensioned on there. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that, but yes, up to 12 inches is allowed. Yep. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Henlon. So I'd like to push back a little bit on what Mr. Carrero said. Um, I do understand that he, that his job is to, to do something that creates a design that works well for the uh, for the homeowner, and and of course, I'm sure that is his primary objective. Uh, he did signify, if I'm not mistaken, that he read through the residential design guidelines, and it sounds to me as if he said to himself, "Well, that's all very well and good, but I don't actually intend to do any of that because it wouldn't be as good for the homeowner on the inside to pay any attention to the outside." And the inside takes precedence over the outside. And it, the whole point of the residential design guidelines is to deal with the issues that come up when you're trying to when you're trying to provide for the design of the community and make sure that everything fits with with everything else. So well, that the that external wait a minute, Mr. Corral, you'll have your chance. And <clears throat> I just want to say that that to the, the kind of answer that Mr. Carrero gave to me sort of seems to say we'll apply the residential guidelines if we like. And I understand that. Uh, and we have the ability to do what we want if you decide not to apply by them. But it seems to me that there are things that you might be able to do consistent with um, providing a design that's acceptable and 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 helpful for the, the occupants. And Mr. Uh, Klein re suggested a number of those things. Um, and I would, it seems to me that it sort of is disrespecting the process to some extent to just put it all out of hand. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, Mr. Carrero, did you have a? I mean, honestly, I don't even know how to reply to that, to be honest. I mean, I it's a small house and it's extremely hard to try and design to meet every single requirement that I have to follow. And some things need to be tweaked a little bit for furniture to lay out in a way that they're going to be happy with the investment that they're making. I want to comply with every single rule that the town wants me to comply with, but sometimes it's extremely hard when you're dealing with very small spaces, when you're trying to fit a 65 inch couch when you only have 55 inches between two windows. But that's the only reason why the windows are where they are. It's it, 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 we want to accommodate every single rule that the town wants to, to follow. But sometimes when the, you're dealing with these smaller homes, you're very yeah. confined to these small spaces and then you have to just tweak certain things. And I'm, I, and like I said, what I want to say is that, I'm more than happy to try to figure out different ways to make that work. I just don't want it to, I just don't want it to delay the process. That's all. These folks have been okay. waiting a long time and I just want to get this home built for them. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Anything else from the board before we go for a public comment? We'll come back and discuss these issues after we have some public comment. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm now gonna be opening the meeting for public comment. Public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand. and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. And those calling in by phone can dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair. You'll be asked to give your name and address to the record, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. For anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to be called upon first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the public comment period will be closed. 
So with that, are there any members of the public who wish to address this application? Um, this is docket number 3820, uh, 57 Ariel Street. Uh, we have a hand raised, uh, Stephen Moore. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thanks, uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, I just, uh, I would like to second the comments that Mr. Hanlon made relative to the design guidelines. The reason they're there is because the desires of the community are balanced with the desires of the homeowners and uh, the design guidelines kind of reflect that balance. Um, and I, I, I am a little surprised based on the multiple times this issue has come up at your, your various meetings over the past couple of years. Um, the, the architects and designers and builders and owners have all been able to accommodate the use of the design guidelines, like moving of the windows, making the windows similar. Um, the demands have never seemed to be that uh, extensive or extravagant. Uh, this is the first time I've, I've heard uh, someone speak sort of against the use of them for the convenience or the, the needs of the, uh, the owners. Um, so I am a little surprised at that. Um, so again, I second what Mr. Hanlon had to say about uh, I'm trying to uh, accommodate them and maybe asking for a continuance to see if that's possible. Um, in the end, it may not be. I understand that the uh, the owners and the uh, uh, the builder may uh, have some some hard uh, resistance here to it, but. I would like, uh, I, I would appreciate that being uh, more carefully considered in this case. Second question, um, I, I was trying to look at Google Maps and, and such to see about uh, uh, trees that are in the backyard. I, uh, this area is very nicely forested, I'll have to say. And so it's very hard for me to pick out what, what trees are there. I would like to ask for you, Mr. Chair, are there uh, any trees in the background that would have to be taken relative to this addition? And uh, also point out uh, in a butter letter that I read that was part of the documentation saying that uh, there was some concerns about the proximity of the neighboring trees to the backyard and the protecting thereby. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, Mr. Robert, do you, I, looking at the site plans, I don't see trees identified on the plans. Uh, they they are not identified. Um, I I walked around the back of the property here. I don't remember anything significant. I would have to uh, check otherwise though. I don't want to uh, say something that is incorrect. Right. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. And, and if I could, <clears throat> the homeowners are, are there all the time. They could uh, probably address that even better than I can. They can just look out their back door. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, there, we have no um, trees on our property. If if that was the question, you're right. Thank you very much okay. for clarifying for us. Yeah, that's helpful. I uh, uh, I would uh, I would direct the the owner's comments. I mean, owner's uh, attention to the neighbor concern about, I guess, large trees they have that are on the edge of their property and just uh, trying to see if uh, tree per, uh, the critical root zone can't be protected during construction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, so the, the town does have tree has a, a tree bylaw that requires a submittal of a tree plan and review by the, the tree warden uh, for work that would impact a tree that's on the, prop the subject property. Um, it doesn't quite apply the same way to trees that are on adjacent properties. Um, which is what the uh, this letter had noted. Um, I would ask. I don't know if the author of the um, the letter is available. If I could add to that a little, Mr. Chairman, um, the Robert. the closest that we're building is basically to the left hand um, <clears throat> neighbor. There is currently already an addition there, which has a foundation. And there is uh, already a deck with a patio underneath it, which is uh, submerged uh, a foot, foot and a half already down below the level. And we again, we are 
utilizing and say, keeping the same line of the building. Uh, I, I can't believe that there would be much of a um, effect on anybody in the rear yard since we are uh, 23 and a, over 23 and a half feet away from the rear yard. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I see that there's only a possibility potentially on the left side, but we already have structures that are there currently. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share this um, memo that was entered into the record. Um, uh, so this was submitted by the abutters at 51 Ariel Street, um, who is responsible to replace, repair any damage done during construction slash excavation, garden with plants and trees that have been in place for 20 plus years abutting the property. Um, so the, um, there's not a particular bylaw or law that protects, um, the abutting property from the property that is, uh, subject to construction. Um, anything that would come up, unfortunately has to go through the civil process, uh, through the courts, if there's a, an issue, uh, we would very strongly recommend that the, um, that the homeowner and the abutter um, have conversation uh, with the contractor about uh, what protections um, can be done to make sure that uh, the impact of the construction does not go beyond the, the property line and to uh, you know, preserve the garden and the, the trees uh, that the abutter is concerned about. Um, but that there's not a particular um, town requirement beyond um, anything that would be included in the uh, the good neighbor agreement, which is more um, a notification to uh, neighbors that there is construction occurring and providing um, information on how to contact the contractor, how to uh, get in touch with people um, if there are concerns during construction. Um, the second has to do with uh, the visible survey markings. Um, I know that the plan that uh, that we had displayed earlier does indicate what marks um, are available. Um, that there's, you know, there are rods that are placed uh, that indicate where the the rear corners are, and I believe that it noted pins at the front. Um, so those would be the the locations of the lines. Um, so I don't know if the author of the letter has anything further they would want to add at this time. Otherwise. Um, I would ask again if there are any other members of the public who wish to address this application. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close uh, the public comment period. Period, excuse me, for this um, application. I would note that the applicant has submitted uh, to the board and has uh, been added into the record. Um, a list of uh, names and addresses and signatures of uh, abutters and others in the neighborhood who are in approve and who approve of the plans or in support of the project. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So thirteen names on that list, um, or I should say, thirteen addresses. Uh, more than thirteen people who are are signed in approval of the the project. And so what the board has before it, um, we have two uh, special mm -hmm. permit requests. Uh, one is under uh, 542B6, which is the um, a large addition. And a large addition does have specific findings that the board needs to make in order to approve uh, mm -hmm. that large addition. And the other is section 539A, uh, which deals with uh, porches that are constructed uh, within the front yard setback. Um, and that does not have any specific uh, findings beyond those uh, for a special permit. Excuse me. Um, so the findings the board would need to make, um, I just want to outline what those findings are, um, and then we can return to the conversation we were having before. Uh, for a large addition, um, 
It's required that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Uh, the board is to consider dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. And the board is to consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. And then the general findings for a special permit, uh, the, the board needs to find that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts, that the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district, um, that the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare, that the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety, the requested use will not overload any public system, um, that any special regulations for the requested use are fulfilled, the requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the district, and the requested use will not be detrimental to public health or welfare, nor will it cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, so in the conversation that, that we have had and the, uh, the feedback we've received from the general public um, and from other people in town, it seems that for the most part, um, there are no uh, strong concerns with this um, proposal with the, the possible exception of um, the questions that were raised about the conformance with the residential design guidelines and how those might be accommodated. Um, <clears throat> so understanding that the um, the review that was performed by the planning department um, only came in today, um, I would ask the board in order to, um, if the board feels that there are uh, minor accommodations that could be made this evening uh, by agreement that would allow us to move forward, that we could sort of have a compromise position, or do members of the board feel that um, the board should make its, uh, I guess, make its sense known as to what it feels would be appropriate efforts um, in order to achieve compliance with the with the residential design guidelines and then um, encourage the the applicant to take the the two week continuance in order to make those uh, modifications. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So uh, I am generally in favor of the two proposals that are being made. And um, in keeping with the comments from Mr. LeBlanc and Mr. Hanlon, I do think it's important uh, to try to get it right with regard to the uh, residential uh, design guidelines. And I, I do understand the desire on the part of the applicants to have this done as quickly as possible to get things started. So I'm sensitive to that. Um, however, I do think that we do try consistently to abide by the guidelines or at least to take them into account when we're making our decisions. So I wouldn't wouldn't be able to vote in favor, I think, tonight if I didn't think that there had been an opportunity taken to try to um, at least look at revising the plan in accordance with the guidelines. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Other members of the board? I mean, in my first reading of it, uh, certainly on that right side elevation, there was the question about the eave details. I think that's something that could readily be um, readily be resolved because it doesn't it does not have any impact uh, to the interior of the building. That would be a, a very simple um, change. Um, there were no other changes recommended to the right side or to the rear, um, nor to the front. And as the board has noted, the front is actually um, rather well thought through um, and and worked out. And it's really you know, very uh, aesthetically pleasing for both the home owners and for the neighborhood. Um, and I think really it comes down to two windows on the on the left hand side. Um, and so I, you know, certainly it's the determination of the board if the board is comfortable um, requesting the applicant to sort of consider whether there are modifications that could be made to, uh, to relocate, to 
sort of shift some of those windows um, to make their placement less haphazard, or if there really is no um, no leeway on the in, with the interior of the house in order to you know accommodate a more regimented exterior. May I may I speak? Yes, please. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure. Um, I I nope. just want to note that we are, um, of course, wanting to comply with the the design standards of the town and uh, think they're very, very well done, actually. And it's just that we haven't, because we just got this notification, haven't had an opportunity to discuss it. But that said, we don't necessarily want to delay as well. Um, right. Because that would, um, you know, there's consequences on both sides. That said, I don't know if we, we know that the ones that we looked at, and I don't know if it's helpful to bring it up again, um, just so we have clarity, the the two windows that are abutting the fireplace would be very tricky to to move. It would change the whole structure of everything. There would be redesign costs, et cetera. But mm -hmm. the windows that are upstairs in the bedrooms could, um, I think, be tweaked, sacrificed, et cetera, to make it more appealing if that was what the intent was. I just I'm not 100 percent sure what recommendation versus like you have to do would be. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Fernando, I don't obviously want to speak out of, uh, something that we can't do as well, but I know that we're all, um, anxious to comply and, but also anxious to, um, how to do it right as well. No, I, I agree. I mean, it, it, it eliminate those windows so that they could then yeah, kind of everything just kind of lines up with what the board is looking for. So I think we could definitely work with that design to, to try to eliminate those two windows upstairs completely. Would there, so I note on the first floor, there's an office at the, that's being constructed new at the front of the building at the front of the house. Sure. Um, I believe that um, Mr. Carrera, that's what you had referenced in terms of um, a space for, uh, for working from home. Is that correct? That is for Jackie. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Because if the if those windows for the family room could shift towards the front of the building, it would basically bring everything into alignment. But um, obviously, that would have a, a a negative impact on that office. Yes, um, a, for how she wanted to lay out her desk area and stuff. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I would note that the office is only being proposed at seven foot six by um, in that dimension, which is. Um, Excuse well, me. Effect still still work. <clears throat> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> Apologize. I thought I was on mute. Um, did you want? It, is it helpful to bring it up? Just because I know that uh, Mr. LeBlanc had some thoughts on on even just the upstairs too, and if we could get to um, a place where we thought that we were taking into account the suggestions with the. Yes. That would be, um, I think that would be really helpful. And may, yeah. yeah. So, so this is the first floor. So in the floor below and the floor above, the windows are offset slightly towards the front. Um, we just go to that elevation again by about half the width of the window is about what we're off by. Um, so obviously on the first floor, if these could shift by half the width of the window, um, that would basically resolve everything, I think, in terms of that elevation. Um, could you go back to that elevation, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So those could be shifted to a line. Okay. That's, that's yeah, not think, a problem at all. Yeah, I think really what it is, it's more just that they go one way and then the other. No, I, I agree. So I definitely could be shifted so that they're more in line. <clears throat> so she'll just end up with an extra window in her office space. Mm -hmm. And then the other one that could shift so that it lines up with the basement window right there, which yeah. would then I could then I can I definitely align those one, two, three, four with the basement. So you definitely could. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the existing windows in the basement. Um, so you're saying that this window here at the front, you would align it. I would I definitely try to get them as close as I can to the basement, but definitely yep. those upper, upper windows on the second and first floor to get yep. them more close closer together. Because with the basement windows, once you have some bushes in front of it, you probably wouldn't see them as much, but they're definitely going to see anything above that grade. Right. I would oh, propose that we eliminate the window on the right side in the bedroom. That's I agree with that too. Yeah. Yeah, and then line up the other two. And then is that the, the bathroom? Is that the bathroom, the one next to it? So this yes. is the bathroom here, so, yeah, and this is so that front bed. I'd eliminate that one and keep the two on the bottom. Mm -hmm. But these still have to line, right? So this guy right here. So the bathroom, if we swapped the tub. We could probably push that over a little to get that to align with the first and second. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some possibilities right there to make it yeah. a little more appealing on that side. Mr. Chair, that window is in the bedroom. I don't think it's in the bathroom. The one that has a box over it. Yeah, that's yeah. A bed. Yeah, that's in the, the those right. two reduced height windows are in the front bedroom. And then this is the bathroom. If let me ask you, if those two in the the bedroom are yep. eliminated, can we keep? Is that enough to then going back to the? It's very tight spaces. If you eliminate those two on the right, so the one you have the box around and the one right next to it, can the other one stay where it is without any changes? So you're saying if you got rid of these two windows. Get rid of those two and keep everything else like it is. What do members of the board think? Like in the right? So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. LeBlanc, um, I think that starts to, <clears throat> excuse me, get us um, in a direction we're looking for, because uh, I I do. You know, obviously, we don't know exactly what the plantings are that's happening, but I do agree with the comment um, that once you do start to to think of there's some plantings down at, at grade uh, in front of those windows that they do start to hide behind the, the plantings and become mm -hmm. less important. Um, and also understand that there are existing windows and it's very difficult to adjust those um, openings. And I think you know, just the way that you're diagramming it here with that line, the window that's in the bathroom has some justification to its location based on the window um, below it, since it's sort of centered on the edge of it. It does mm -hmm. have some type of a logical relationship to it. Um, so I think that that sort of works. You know, it would be lovely if that basement window is slightly to the right so that it kind of did the same thing, but, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's just not what's going on. It's uh -huh. it's really not that complicated to move a basement window too, so we can definitely do that. They're small enough that it's easy mm -hmm. to move them. So yeah. the only the only thing is the, is the cross ventilation that we may maybe deal with the challenge to try to get a cross ventilation on that room up above with the lack of a window there. Mm -hmm. I would even argue you don't have to get rid of both of them. You could mm -hmm. keep one of them. Um, I, I just love I natural would, air. Uh, I love to be able to air out a house. So, yeah. uh, you know, so to me, to, for me not to get a window on either end of the room, I, you can't, you can never get that cross ventilation to, to get that nice fresh air coming through the house. I've always tried to encourage my, my customers to just never depend on air conditioning and everything else. Just depend on natural, <laughs> natural air flow to your house to let your house breathe and, and just be a healthy home. So, mm -hmm. so it's just, Trying to keep that in mind, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I sort of agree with the statement that I think Mr. Blank just the Blank just made that it isn't really that critical necessarily to get rid of both of the windows on the second floor. I mean, the issue here isn't that there are too many windows, but the lack of a logical structure that connects the ones you have, and I think that you've got plenty. In fact it may even be better to have to preserve one of those windows anyway and to use that to create you know to create the kind of structure that the guidelines are are looking for so certainly if the applicant would prefer to maintain them i wouldn't be pushing them 
to eliminate that window un unless they felt that it was desirable for the mother for other reasons. Looking again at the at this elevation, so if the base, if this the basement circle, the basement window that's circled, if that shifted to the right to align with the window on the second floor, we keep the two windows on the first floor where they are. We keep the window on the second floor in the bathroom where it is, and then in the front bedroom. Rather than two windows, if it was a single bedroom that was centered on the room in the basement, would that address the board's concerns? And would that be amenable to the applicant? Jackie? Um, my sorry, my question is I I had thought that there was some opportunity to make some window changes and that what we were looking for was the footprint and yes, some of the design, but is the, is by saying this, we're locked in because that, that's what I'm just not 100% clear on. Sure, so the, the, the decision that you'll receive from the board is based on the documents that you have provided. And so if you make changes after the board has approved the drawings, you need to come back to the board for approval. Um, because it's all one package. It's not, we're approving a footprint. We're approving the project. And Mr. Chair, I guess just to clarify, yeah. um, we could co all come to an agreement tonight as to what the window layout should be. And then they could update the drawings to comply with that decision and that they would not have to come back to the board because they're complying with the decision. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. So the, the intention, um, I guess, just to explain it is to try and come to an agreement so that we would not have to continue or so you would not have to come back uh, to help move along the project as been stated before. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, I, I have a question, um, Please. for Fernando, mm -hmm. which is the kitchen. We, yeah. we hadn't, um, solidified some of those windows, mm -hmm. but what I'm hearing here is that mm -hmm. no, you have to have everything locked in or else you have to come back. So I'm, I guess we're just a little confused on it's, it's I a, mean, it's I a think monster. if your kitchen window it gets it becomes wider but stays within the same location, I don't think the board's gonna have any yeah. issue with that. You know what I mean? So I think we're talking about more of the ones to the right of that kitchen window, and I think that moving the basement window to a line, maybe getting rid of one of those two. I think it's it pretty fair, and it's it's a, it's an easy decision to to for us to work on the design and then submit it, but then to have them proceed to go forward with the permission to do everything else that we're looking for as far as the special permits and everything else. You're talking about the casement there, right, Jackie? Talking about that casement between the two on the back edition. I'm, I, I can visualize more on a floor plan than I can on elevations, if you don't mind putting the first floor out for me, please. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think we definitely, we have our kitchen position where we liked it, Jackie. So if that window Hi. ends up, you know what I mean? I think that when you work with the kitchen design, you definitely will tweak the layout on the inside, but we have plenty of opportunity there to work with um, with that kitchen window. As far as the other two windows on the first floor, I think the second floor is the one that I was a little more concerned about cross ventilation for that front bedroom. That that was trying to get some light, natural light into the room. Mm -hmm. 
we haven't finalized the kitchen design yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, and, and I mean certainly the the building inspector has some discretion in terms of you know what constitutes a change that needs to come before the board and what constitutes a a minor change that is still within keeping with the decision. Yeah, we we always try to let our kitchen designer finalize the kitchen layout. We try to plug it in as much as we can to just yep. get a better fit, a sense for the whole space and how we position staircase and everything else. But, you know, the window could be wider, could move over a couple of inches left to right, to, you know, because the layout of the stove, the fridge and everything else, everything has to fit in the right place. But yeah. but I think we're okay, Jackie, on that part. I think we can work with that. Okay. Okay, so then just going back to that elevation. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been just jotting notes for conditions. Uh, so one would be that the, this basement window would be shifted to the right to align with the second floor second bathroom floor. window. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the two, the front bedroom would have a single window that would be centered over the basement window. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if the window was this same height, or if you wanted it the height of the same, you know, the, the bathroom window, you know, that that kind of a change is less um, less concerning. It it's more just the the horizontal arrangement. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Holly, yeah, the I think the window, two of those windows are in the front bedroom and so is in the primary bedroom on the back right it's a triple i'm not trying to increase the cost by any means here if you take a triple and then overlay it lines up centered with the basement the intent is you know and still retaining the ventilation and light as needed i think it's high because they want to have a headboard on that side i believe that is reason. correct it's all about bed placement yes oh i see sure yeah, right, right. I'd rather not have the windows if if we have to decide on windows or no windows. I'd rather not have those windows if that's what the question is. Right take now. the wall space. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason for them to be so small and up high. It was just to, to fit a headboard underneath it. Right. That's yeah. Because it was very limited side to side. Because if you want to do a full size, the rooms are so small. The windows, yeah. the headboard, end up being on top of the windows. You know. But Jackie's fine with eliminating them. If she's, yeah, that's fine. We can take them off to him. So I have, yeah, so on the left elevation, the left basement window is to be shifted to the right to be centered on the second floor bathroom window above. Mm -hmm. And then on the left elevation, the second floor bedroom shall have one window centered on the basement window below or no window. And then Correct. on the right elevation, the evens are to be detailed similar to the rear of the house, just so that all the those even mm -hmm. details are similar. Uh, do you mean the front of the house? No, the front and the rear are, are similar. Okay. The front of the house may be a little extra fancy because of some of the detailing that's going on. So I figured the rear of the house would be a simpler to match. And the right side is you talk you're talking about the dormer that's coming off of it to match that detail. What yeah. here, yeah, just because it ha it has the the sheep's foot rather than the returned. The pigeon drops, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, is the board comfortable with the with um? these conditions meeting the terms of the residential design guidelines? 
I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chair, as well, I think it ended up being a good discussion and compromise to get us to a, a nice end goal. Right, perfect. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead and close the share. All right, so returning then to the findings the board is required to make. Um, so the first would be uh, for the uh, under large additions that the board needs to find that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Um, where this is a single family use in a single family neighborhood, similar to the adjacent houses, um, the applicants are seeking to increase the size of their house in order to uh, increase their um, their usage of the house and to uh, to make the house more in conforming to the way that they they use the house and the way that they need to use the house. Uh, I think the discussion we had in regards to the residential design guidelines speaks to the harmony. Um, this house will have with the other structures and members of the board had spoken earlier about um, the, the way they, the front of the house appears and uh, the way that that the porch is a very, very nice um, amenity, especially uh, on the on the front facing the street. Um, the board is to consider dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. Um, admittedly, we have not put as much um, thought into that, I will briefly bring up, see if I can quickly bring up the map. Wait. So just briefly the map of the area. Um, this is the subject property at 57 Ariel Street. Um, the addition would be in this position here, which is note that the addition is sort of beyond the dimension of the, of the property immediately to their uh, south southwest and is being built out in an area that is um, relatively open in relation to the other houses. So I think the board could find that the dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses will not be detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and in regards to conformity with the purpose of the bylaw, the purpose of the bylaw is to um, not only to preserve open space and um, and access to air and light, but also to um, improve the the structures within the the town to increase the value of the town and to increase the the tax base, um, and certainly that would all be accomplished by what the applicants are proposing. Uh, then moving on to the required findings under three three three, the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts. Um, where this is residential structure and this is a, a, a uh, set an addition uh, both to the front and rear that is in keeping with um, the purposes of the the design guidelines and the purposes of the zoning ordinance um, this will certainly not have um, any kind of negative adverse impacts um, that would come close to uh, meeting the beneficial impacts that it will provide and the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district as we had noted at the top there are two special uh, permit sections that this uh, falls under. One is 542B6 for a large addition, and the other is 539A for the front porch and the front yard setback. Um, as the uh, the builder had noted, the addition um, will on the left hand, excuse me, on the right hand side will still be conforming with the side yard setback. On the left hand side, while it will be constructed within the required left side setback, it is farther from the lot line than the existing houses. Um, and therefore it is, uh, uh, the board would not consider that to be uh, detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, the next, uh, the requested use is essential or desirable to public convenience or welfare. Um, 
the expansion of the the house, the allowing the neighbors, the excuse me, the residents to live in their neighborhood with um, and to enjoy the benefits of of being uh, with their neighbors and the the neighbors' benefit of of having them in their neighborhood, along with um, as you noted before, the increase in the, the the value of the property and the usability of the property are all uh, desirable to the public convenience and welfare. I will not create undue traffic congestion. As the applicant noted, there will be no change in parking. There will be little or no change to the visibility of the street. Uh, so there should not be an impact on pedestrian safety or traffic congestion. The requested addition is not so large that it would overload any public system. Um, the special regulation for the requested uses are fulfilled. Uh, those were the considerations for the large addition, which we have already reviewed. Requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the district. We have already addressed that um, essentially through the conditions for the large addition. Um, requested use will not be detrimental to public health or welfare. Um, so we'll have no impact on the health or welfare uh, beyond the residents of house, in which case it will be improved. And the requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, it's not really applicable here where it is a single family within a single family district. Um, so those are the findings that I would propose the board could meet. Um, are there any questions in regards to those potential findings? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just to note for the record, the conclusions that we come to with respect to the effect of this on neighboring properties is supported by the document that we have indicating fairly widespread support in the neighborhood for um, for this project, and we haven't really heard anything that 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 is is negative. Uh, it's not exactly conclusive proof, but it certainly is a strong indication that this will fit well with the neighborhood and be well received with within the neighborhood and in accordance with the residential design guidelines. All right, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Okay, so the should the board vote to uh, proceed with this applicant with approving the application, uh, there are the three standard conditions which the board would include. The first is the plans and specifications approved by the board for this special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from the approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Number two, the building inspectors hereby notify they're to monitor the site and to proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine that violations are present. Building inspectors shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. And number three, uh, if necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. Number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this variance, variance uh, excuse me, special permit grant. Um, then there are the additional conditions, uh, which I'd read before, but I'll uh, put back in. Um, on the left elevation, the left basement window is to be shifted to the right to be centered on the second floor bathroom window above. Um, the left On the left elevation, the second floor bedroom shall have one window centered on the basement window below or no windows. Uh, on the right elevation, the eave ends are to be detailed similar to the rear of the house. And uh, then the applicant is to provide revised construction drawings documenting all changes and correcting all deficiencies as discussed at the hearing to the Inspectional Services Department for review. Are there any additional conditions which members of the board would wish to recommend for this project? Seeing none, um, <clears throat> Mr. Hanlon, would you be prepared to uh, draft a, a written decision um, recommending approval of the special permit as so as conditioned? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would. Great. Uh, so then, with that, um, unless there's anything further from the applicants, um, as we stated before, the the board will uh, vote to close. We will prepare the written decision, and then at our uh, meeting in two weeks, uh, we will vote on the final written decision, and then you're clear to go. 
So with that, um, I move to close the public hearing on docket number 3820-57 Ariel Street. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So vote, roll call vote of the board to close the public hearing on docket 3820-57 Ariel Street. Uh, responding yes or no, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Uh, this hearing is closed. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your working with us uh, to work through these details. And um, we will vote on your decision next time. Thank you, Bill. Thank all you very much. much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you, board. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we return to our agenda. So the final item uh, this evening is uh, item number five on our agenda, docket 3824-232, Massachusetts Avenue. Um, this is an address that had come before the board um, previously, a few months ago. Uh, there was a question about the, the legal status of a pre-existing non-conforming use on the property. Um, at that time, the at the recommendation of the board uh, and the recommendation of the legal department, the applicant had withdrawn their application to uh, go into discussions with the legal department about the status of the property um, and to be able to establish uh, whether there was an exist, uh, whether the pre existing use had been discontinued or not. Um, so this application is now a uh, before us anew. So I would ask the applicant to introduce themselves, um, tell us a little bit about their experience with the, the legal department and explain what they're proposing to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mike Corey of Madoff and Corey in Foxborough for the applicant who is the proposed tenant at the property. Uh, with, with us tonight are representatives of the landlord. I'll um, we come before you uh, pursuant to an application for a special permit under Section 8.1.2B of the Arlington Zoning Bylaw to authorize a change of a prior non-conforming uh, commercial use of one of the four commercial units located at the um, uh, single-story commercial block um, that includes 232-234 Mass Ave. Uh, specifically, we seek approval for a change in use from a dry cleaning business, which was formerly located at this space, to high end beer, wine, and liquor shop. Uh, our client, um, uh, Nilcant 232 Inc., uh, seeks this board's approval for a change in use under Section 8.1.2B to establish at the 2100 square foot single story unit, uh, there's a storage area in the basement, uh, a high end boutique wine shop. Uh, featuring premium wines, craft beers, and other liquor products. Um, the Arlington Select Board and the Mass ABCC uh, issued a liquor license as of January 2024, subject to necessary zoning relief from your, um, from your board. Um, the property uh, in which the unit's located was built roughly 80 years ago uh, as a single-story commercial block, uh, which currently houses an Italian food shop, a salon and an office of the uh, U.S. Postal Service. Uh, until mid 2021, the subject unit was occupied by a dry cleaning business. However, due to the effects of COVID and for other reasons, uh, the dry cleaner closed in mid 2021 and the landlord scrambled to find a replacement tenant. Over the past two years, your applicant, um, the proposed test, worked closely with the landlord to negotiate the terms of the lease and to gain approval. Uh, from the select board and the ABCC for the issuance of a liquor license. Um, following the select board's approval, um, subject again to zoning relief uh, in July of 2023, and with the ABCC approval of the license in January 2024, uh, finalized the lease agreement with the landlord and began working um, with the building department to determine what zoning relief might be needed. Um, the uh, Initially and erroneously, as you said, uh, we believe that a variance to the use of the property might be appropriate if the town deemed the uh, prior non-conforming use of that single unit within the building uh, to have been abandoned. Uh, we came before the board this summer 
uh, where you clarified that it was not permitted, the board isn't permitted uh, to issue use variances under the terms of your zoning code. Uh, uh, alternatively, we argued that the failure of the dry cleaner in mid-2021 um, and the uh, landlords and our efforts to establish the new tenancy uh, did not result in an abandonment. Um, uh, in light of the fact that there are three other units of the property fully occupied by commercial tenants and um, that we had engaged in a, a diligent and difficult effort in the post-COVID period to obtain a replacement tenant. Um, uh, this board uh, recommended that we go to uh, town council and the building commissioner uh, who agreed that um, the uh, the use wasn't abandoned and suggested that we come to this this board um, for relief under section 8.1.2b uh, for a special permit, a change uh, in a non-conforming use. Um, the property is currently zoned in the R6 district, which does not permit further development of commercial space. However, um, given the fact that this property has existed for the past 80 years as a commercial um, development, um, it is uh, grandfathered, um, and the applicant proposes under this application to um, change that commercial use, which was a dry cleaner, to offer um, an appealing array of craft beer, wines, and spirits uh, for the people in the neighborhood and the general public. Um, in the in its dealing with the select board um, last year, the applicant agreed in connection. Uh, with that to that there would be no single serve bottles of liquor sold there, no kegs, no cigarettes, no candy. Um, essentially this would be a, a higher end stylish um, um, beer and wine and liquor shop. Uh, the area doesn't have many liquor uh, stores. Uh, the closest is 0.3 to 0.4 miles away with two others, uh, one to 1.5 miles away. Other shops exist in Somerville and Cambridge at a further distance. Um, 8.1.2B authorizes uh, this board to uh, grant a change uh, in a prior non-conforming use if uh, the new proposed use is not substantially different from the prior use uh, and is not detrimental to the neighborhood uh, in comparison to the prior use. Uh, we submit that the quality of the liquor shop proposed for this location will add substantial value and appeal to the neighborhood and expand the range of uh, retail products available um, within the area and within walking distance of this neighborhood. Um, despite its residential uh, zoning, the area has many retail and other commercial services available, and the proposed liquor shop uh, will add to that variety. Um, we suggest that. Um, on that basis, the first criteria uh, for granting um, a special permit under 8.1.2B is met. The establishment of the liquor store uh, will be desirable to the neighborhood and the public in general. Um, the second criteria uh, that the, uh, the bylaw recommends concerns traffic. Um, the shop won't adversely uh, impact either traffic or pedestrian safety. Uh, total square footage of the retail space is 2,100 square feet on one floor. Um, and um, uh, there's plenty of off-street park uh, parking. Uh, and um, there are several pedestrian crosswalks and barriers in place to protect and guide motorists and pedestrians. Uh, the third criteria under uh, Section 8.12B asks if the proposed service would overload any public water drainage or sewer system or other municipal, um, uh, any municipal system. Um, this is a small uh, shop uh, that won't affect adversely any public utility or the neighborhood in general. Uh, there's no manufacturing, no washing, no intensive operations of the property. There'll be very little demand for public water and sewer. Uh, there's a half bathroom in the rear of the building, or the unit. Uh, which would be used almost exclusively by the shop staff. Um, uh, a fifth criteria uh, that the town uh, points to is whether the requested use will impair the integrity or character of the district. 
Uh, neighbors enjoy access to a variety of retail and commercial outlets along Mass Ave, uh, but there aren't any uh, liquor stores in the immediate area. Um, the shop will give these neighbors a new option within walking distance. Uh, finally, the proposed location will be the only uh, uh, liquor store within uh, less than a half mile and will be only one of three in the general area uh, in our, in the town of Arlington. Uh, there's no concern over an overload of liquor retailing in the area. To the contrary, the establishment of this small shop will provide an amenity that's not currently available. Uh, and for these reasons, we ask that the board uh, grant the special permit under 8.1.2B uh, to allow a change in use from the uh, prior dry cleaner to a small uh, beer, wine, and liquor shop, subject to the conditions and uh, limitations which the Arlington Select Board issued in its liquor license um, to the applicant. Um, that's my initial presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions from the board. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to quickly bring up the plans. Sure. Um, So the <clears throat> Mass Ave here is at the bottom. This is the uh, the rear egress way to the back. Right. Uh, noted. Um, here's there's uh, display racks in the center of the store. There's walk-in cooler on the right hand side. Uh, I believe this is the the cashier's area here on the left. Is that correct? Yeah, and there are uh, yes, Mr. Chair. There are um, glass display cases. Um, mm -hmm. There are um, uh, six of them. Okay. And then Inclus the space back here isn't labeled. I was curious what this space is. Ah, uh, let me see. In an earlier iteration, it was labeled as a humidor. It can't be a humidor. Um, yeah. There's no tobacco um, available to be sold. And I apologize for that. The floor plan that was issued, um, that was filed before, uh, was a standard plan um, that the applicants' affiliates uh, use in operating liquor stores and tobacco shops. Here, there's going to be absolutely no tobacco. Uh, so that would be a storage area. Okay. Um, and then are you making any modifications to the existing entrance to the building? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, if I know the my, uh, the tenant's, uh, principal is traveling tonight. Oh. Um, it, I know the landlord's representative is, uh, is here. Uh, I would. I'm wondering if he has any yeah. uh, information hey, on that. Hi, Ryan. Yes. That is the doorway as it is currently drawn is how it currently is. Okay. Do you know if it meets the accessibility code? Um, that is my understanding. Uh, there's no like step up there if that's what you're asking. Okay. Um, I I don't recall specifically for this storefront. Uh, there's a it, there's a vast number of storefronts in, in the town of Arlington that have historic um, uh, non-accessible entrances uh, that often are not addressed as a part of interior fit-outs. Um, so I just wanted to, to just yeah. see if there was any specific things that were noted for this entrance that would need to be modified. Yeah, as part of the process we went through with Mike Corey and Mike Sampa, they actually did a site visit and came okay. and inspected the site, and they did not mention any accessibility concerns about how it was currently outlaid. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, and the only other thing I had flagged this earlier, um, in the when you were discussing uh, traffic 
congestion. You had noted that there's ample off-street parking available. Um, and we had noted there is actually no off-street parking because there's no parking oh. lot or anything like that. It's on-street parking. I apologize. Um, I misspoke. Yeah. Nope, no problem. I just want to make sure that that gets picked up in the record. Um, did did you perform any kind of survey of the the number of parking spaces that are nearby to this uh, to this location? Uh, we did not. Um, uh, as I understand it, there are um, a number of side streets uh, that have um, uh, available parking. Um, that uh, again, it's it's a twenty one hundred square foot shop. It's not a large one, um, and this building has existed with its um, with its commercial uses uh, without any. Um, off street parking uh, uh, for a, a good deal of time. Yeah, and Mike Tampa had mentioned when we were talking with him that he didn't really see like the traffic in and out of the store changing from the laundromat. You you go in, you pick something up, and you leave. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't necessarily directly address the parking issue. Um, but also, it's going to be at primarily open at alternate hours to the post office as well. So that mm -hmm. would be one thing in the favor of that. Great. Thank you. Um, and then the, the last question I had is one of the findings the board would need to make is that the new use is not a substantially different use. Um, and so if you could just sort of explain a little bit uh, between a dry cleaning business and a, a high-end liquor store, um, what the differences are and how they're not su substantially different. Uh, well, um, Mr. Chair, in, 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 in looking at that question, what, what you need to, what I think you need to uh, consider is, is the use commercial uh, as opposed to industrial uh, or manufacturing storage. This is just another uh, brand of commercial retail um, use and service to um, uh, the neighborhood. Um, yes, it, it is it is a different product and service being offered than a, uh, a laundromat, uh, but it is a retail um, product and service being offered. And that is what this building has uh, provided uh, the neighborhood um, long before it became an R6 district. So in terms of um, it being a uh, a residential operation, I mean, excuse me, a retail operation. Uh, I think it fits well within that, um, and the um, the nature of the product being sold or the service. It's no longer going to be uh, laundry, uh, but it's it's a uh, it's a worthwhile uh, and beneficial um, retail product to the uh, to the neighborhood. You can't really fit anything more than uh, a small uh, retail uh, business mm -hmm. or service in that in that space, uh, as as is shown by the other um, uh, by the other tenants' operations. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I think the chair's screen is frozen. The chair is frozen. Yeah. It will come back. <laughs> I have confidence. I guess right now you're the chair, Mr. Hanlon. Yeah, but I can't recognize myself. I actually can. But, but I but I what I would like the chairman to do is put 8.2, 8.1.2B on the screen. And he knows how to share his screen and I don't. Oh, let me try, Mr. Curry. Let me, so we don't, whoops. Let me get started. Um, I'm looking at a copy of the bylaw that I think is the most recent copy, but it may very well have missed something that we did last year in town meeting. Right. Um, but as I read 
B, a, B says, any non-conforming principal use of a structure shall not be extended. However, any non-conforming use of a structure may be changed to another non-conforming use by special permit, provided that the Board of Appeals finds that the new use is not a substantially different use and not more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use. And so my first question is, did, is what I just read the text that you're relying on? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so your view, I, as I understand it, is, is that if the use is retail, any change to a retail use, I mean, even if it was a bigger use that had a lot of traffic, would all be the same, and you shouldn't have, just have to rely on the more detrimental part. But that but change of use they, there, you mean re retail to retail, commercial to right. commercial, industrial to, to industrial, and so forth. Right. And you're you're aware, aren't you, that there are a number of cases that in, in somewhat different contexts have a much where the courts apply a much more a, a much less formalistic view of what a retail use is. Um, and I don't want to debate you about that, but I'm wondering if we look up to uh, section eight point one point one. Uh, it says a pre pre existing non conforming structures or uses may be extended or altered, provided that no such extension or alteration shall be permitted unless there is a finding by the Board of Appeals that such change, extension, or alteration shall not be substantially more detrimental than the existing non conforming structure or use to the neighborhood. And if I were unpersuaded by the notion that, that a change from a laundry to a liquor store is not a change of use. Wouldn't it be possible for you to rely on that and say whatever it is, it's it, it's either not a change or it is. And if it is, it's an alteration. And if it's an alteration, the this, this same substantially more detrimental standard applies. So you could proceed under 8.1.1a <clears throat> as well. Isn't that is that wrong? I appreciate I appreciate that, Mr. Hamlet. Thank you. Yeah, no, that is um that's true. In in our view, this is the only thing that can be the only use that this uh, unit, uh, one of four, can be put uh, to which it can be put uh, is a retail use. And um, so in terms of uh, substantially different, I'm, I, I, I would argue that it is not substantially different as long as it's tail and you go to the um, you go to the uh, the test as to whether it's uh, more detrimental, uh, but um, your um, your citation to eight point one point one also applies, um, I believe. Um, yes, yes. My, Michael, to the detrimental part as well. Liquor stores were considered an essential service during COVID, while dry cleaners were not. So that that kind of addresses that point as well. Uh -huh. No, I do think that it just in general, I mean, dry cleaners have got their their issues as as well as you know. The processes for being a dry cleaner are not always environmentally uh, right. benign, and there are certain hazards that come from them. So it's not as if you're dealing with you know a a, a use that uh, is just it. it this, it may not be as high a bar, but I don't really think that that a liquor store is intrinsically a more or less uh, uh, a more or less detrimental use than a, 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 a dry car. We'll have a hearing on that, but uh, certainly I think that that in either case you need to establish that you're not substantially more detrimental and. Uh, uh, and I'm assuming I'm reading this substantially word into 8.1.2b, but uh, I, it seems to me that that we haven't yet heard, but it doesn't seem a priori that uh, the two uses, that this use is, is more detrimental than the other one. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've, I've basically usurped the chair in your absence and would like to give it back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Apologize <laughs> for the... Uh, vagaries of Zoom. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman? 
Mr. DuPont. So um, I was just curious, did we receive a memorandum from the legal department about this? Because I do remember the question came up as to abandonment, uh, you know, earlier. And so I, I'm not sure what the reasoning was if in fact the legal department decided that there was not abandonment. And I do, I am sensitive to the idea that, you know, COVID threw everything into a, you know, a cocked hat and it was difficult to make sense of things at the time. Um, but I do have a question about the abandonment issue um, because I went online, I was looking, I guess the question I have is, you know, when was the dry cleaner uh, business discontinued exactly? So I had, a, I had a conversation with town council on um, October 30th. Um, I believe Mr. Hannon was there as well. Um, and the uh, and town council noted that the prior non-conforming use um, that was there, which is the dry cleaners, um, town council had visited the site with... <clears throat> excuse me, with the inspectional services director. Um, and they found that there was, there was still evidence that the prior use remained. Um, and for that reason, they decided that it was not abandoned. And what, as of what date did you say? So this was a conversation I had with them in, um, October on October 30th. But this was a determination they had made between when we had um, heard this initially, I believe Mr. Corey said uh, sometime around July um, and now. And, and you're saying that um, because I was the, the you know, town has made a determination that the that it's not an abandoned non-conforming use. It's not an abandonment. Okay, I mean, I I read <clears> the <throat> definition. I was trying to pay particular attention to that. I went online, I saw the uh, Google Maps, I saw that back in, I believe it was October of uh, 22, there was a for lease sign in the window. So I was just trying to make all of those sort of dates line up in order to determine whether or not there had been a two year period uh, in which the, you know, the business, the prior non-performing use was continued. Um, you know, getting back though, if I may, to the question about a substantially different use in 8.1.2B, I know there it says um, that we have to find that the new use is not substantially different. And if you go up to 8.1.1A, there's also a sentence, and I believe it's the second sentence, which says, after you see the date where it says December 14th, 2017, however, this bylaw shall apply to any change uh, or extension of such use. So it doesn't in that first paragraph, and I, this, I'll this i be honest with you, this first paragraph always drives me nuts because when I read it, I look at it and I'm trying to piece together the sentences into a, a patchwork that can make some sense, you know, depending on what the circumstances are. But so it strikes me that, you know, you don't have the benefit of 8.1 um, to, to A to take this forward. And I do think it gets you down to this 8.1 B or 8.1.2 B. And I do have some difficulty with the idea um, that a liquor store is not substantially different than a dry cleaner. Um, because I think, again, it sounds like really if what you're looking at is saying that really any retail use uh, means that it's not substantially different. I just think that that's a very, very broad statement to make. And so um, it's not that I am not in favor of this, but I still can't quite get beyond the fact that it seems like it's substantially different to me. So I guess I'm just looking for some more direction or more uh, interpretation from members of the board, you know, how, how people might look at this differently. 
Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So <clears throat> I'm not entirely convinced that that you that section 8.1.2b refer it means that anything within a broad category like retail uh, is always the same. I mean, you could easily, for example, have a retail use that generates very little traffic and substitute a retail treat like a fast food ch shop that generates quite a bit. Uh, I think that would probably be considered a different use. And there, there are a number of cases that that seem to go in that way. Now, to be sure, you could simply say that McDonald's or another such enterprise would be would be more detrimental than say Zaz or something, but and they're both retail restaurants. But I, it 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 seems to me that 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 I'm less confident. I think that Mr. Curry is that as long as you can match them up on a general category, that it's never the change. I think you have to look at the the nature of each of the uses and that changing what you sell may very well change the nature of the use because what you sell affects retail uses in lots and lots of different ways. Um, I'm not as I'm not as concerned as Mr. DuPont is about the applicability of 8.1.1 because it seems to me that if pre if the sentence that begins pre-existing non-conforming structures or uses may be extended or altered, that has to be thought of as being ad addressing a situation more like this and has to be if if it doesn't if it's trumped by the preceding sentence then it doesn't mean anything at all and surely they were attempting to say that you have some sort of a rule that's different if you're talking about pre-existing non-conforming uses or structures um i think that that the first the second sentence of 8.1.1 actually doesn't talk about previous non pre-existing pre non-conforming uses at all yet uh, it is an attempt to sort of define what a pre-existing non-conforming use might be. Um, so I'm not willing just basically to assume that the sentence that I read uh, would would not be applicable. Uh, it seems to me that that if it's not applicable here, it's probably not applicable anywhere. Uh, certainly, you have a pre-existing non-conforming use. It probably is a use that long, pre, pre, that predated the applicability of the bylaw, and certainly the pro prohibition that exists here. Um, and but again, what you end up with is applying the substantially more detrimental test, which is very similar to the test that you apply under 8.1.2b. Um, and it seems to me. So for that reason, I, I, I would have preferred to rely on Section eight point one point one, because I don't because I think that that if if it means anything, then the pre existing non conforming structure sentence must be a limitation on the import of the sentence immediately preceding it. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Ali. Just, uh, I just noticed when um, we were um, as discussed by most, by most, uh, by Mr. Hanlon and um, uh, about the use, about substantially different. There is a definition, a use which, because of its normal operation, would cause readily observable differences in patronage, service appearance, noise, employment, or similar characteristics from the use to which it is being compared. Um, so I think rather, you know, would have the board members review maybe some of these or if not compare that with, you know, on each attributes that has been outlined in the definition there um, is something we could look into um, to make that establish that, dif you know, difference there. Thank you for that. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. where did Mr. Holy uh, come up with that language? I'm just asking uh, what that citation is, where? It's under the def definition um, uh, page. Um, uh, it's it's used a but substantially different. Yeah. Page 2-22. 
two dash twenty one. Yeah, um, under two dash twenty two. Correct. Yeah. I mean, strictly speaking, um, it is different because of the patronage service appearance, noise, and employment. Is there a you know common consensus on that by the board members? Is something we can look into. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I'm, I I don't actually think that that if you, if you know this particular location and the and the store the dry cleaner that was there earlier, I mean it is possible that there are certainly some liquor stores that could be quite different. I don't think that's likely to be true here. Uh, it's a very small space. The it's not appealing to a vastly different clientele than the people who would have used the the uh, the other store. Uh, it's located in a complex that influences the nature of the of the use that will take place. And I think the underlying import of the definition that Mr. Holy read is that you look at the specific st specific characteristics of the use at a particular site. Um, and frankly, here, I, I'm guessing that if I walk down this part of Massachusetts Avenue, as I very frequently do, I will not see if they have something like a competitor, Giles, down the street. Uh, I, I'm not seeing, I don't think that I would be very likely to see any difference in the way this property is being used with the proposal that we have before us than I saw when I would walk by it almost every day. Um, when it was a dry cleaner. So I, I think as a matter of fact, in this particular case with this particular property and the limitations of this particular property, that most of the characteristics that Mr. Holy read would be pretty much the same between this use and uh, the use that was that, that was there before. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I did have a Question uh, for the applicant in regards to uh, deliveries as to how those would be handled at this site. Uh, those would be uh, delivered uh, through the front door because there isn't any other um, uh, viable access. Uh, and the select board um, in its notes of its meeting in July of 2023 uh, addressed and discussed with the applicant and his liquor license counsel, um, mm -hmm. Andrew Upton, who um, uh, I work with, but um, he is not, uh, and he's at a, at a different firm. Um, uh, he is not here tonight. Um, the, um, the select board addressed and indicated for their, the minutes of their meeting that they were satisfied, but the um, deliveries would have to come through the front door uh, and the, um, uh, the permit that the select board, I'm sorry, the liquor license that the select board would need to issue, um, I believe will, um, what, when and if this board approves it, um, approves the zoning relief needed, uh, we'll address that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I just address the discussion about substantially different use? Sure. Uh, as Mr. Hanlon said, Yes, the, the product itself will be different, um, but there'll be the same, essentially the same number of employees, same number of traffic, the same degree of traffic in and out of the, uh, in and out of the door. Uh, there'll be no noise um, coming from uh, either the, the dry cleaner or the, um, or the liquor store. Um, and the patronage will be, you know, we anticipate it will be primarily um, the neighborhood uh, with occasional outsiders pulling over and finding a place to park. So um, in the um, in the definition uh, that I should have referenced in my application, but Mr. Hawley found, um, I think it fits well within that. All right, thank you, Mr. Corey. Are there any further questions from the board at this time? Mr. Chair, I had one, one question. Yes. Um, on the item of, uh, in reference to 8.1.2B, uh, again, not trying to go ahead of myself here on this topic, but 
any non-conforming use which has been once changed to a permitted use shall not be again changed to another non-conforming use. Is it is it my is it, is the understanding that if this gets changed to the liquor store, does it make that as a per, um, a conforming permit use and cannot go back? It, it, how does this uh, apply? It's more a question than a, a clarification. This is regards to, regard to one point. 8.1.2 D. D. So the current use is non-conforming and we and they're requesting it to be changed to another non-conforming use. Um granted it would be permitted as such. Right. Um, which would then imply that once it becomes a liquor store, it couldn't be used for any other purpose except for a conforming use. So I believe that dry cleaners predated the um, the zoning that cr changed this to a residential district. Mr. Corey? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to suggest, Mr. Chair, that the term permitted use would mean, uh, would be uh, a direction to look to your table of uses. If it's a, yep. you know, permitted use would be one allowed by right. That's it. Not that it would be a conforming use. Right, right. Unless it Which would be in this case, sorry, Mr. Chair, I, um, what would be the permitted use? I probably have to go check my uh, the application. So right now, this is an R6, so R6, it's limited okay. to residential uses. Okay, got it. Thank you. So once, it's, once it becomes residential, it can no longer be commercial. Right. With that, I think we're at a good point to um, open this discussion to the public. Um, <clears throat> so opening the meeting for public comment, pub, just a reminder that public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. If you wish to speak, you can digitally raise your hand using the uh, React button, uh, React tab at in the Zoom application, those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address for the record and be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first Let me wait just a minute to see if Christian comes back. There you go. Sorry, that kicked me out fast. Um, so are there any members of the public who wish to address this hearing? <laughs> Usually I get some warning that it's like things will freeze and then I know it's coming, but it just was bam, done. Okay, uh, we do have a hand raised. Um, this is Ryan Cronin. Hello. Um, I was speaking earlier with Mike. I just wanted to add to the point oh, that- I just know that Mr. Cronin is representative of the owners. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to add earlier that when we went before the select board that there was um, a lot of public support behind this. We had about mm -hmm. 30 to 40 letters of people in support of this business. At the, at the time of the hearing with the select board, were there any specific recommendations in regards to deliveries? Um, I don't remember specifically. I do know that there is also like a back entrance there. And I, I have to assume that with the number of businesses on Mass Ave that there's kind of some sort of like standard procedure as to timing when they should be receiving them. Okay. 
I just know when I look on Google to look at the storefront, all I see is a big delivery truck. Oh, really? Um, yeah, there is, there is that back alleyway that um, I don't know where the truck would park, but they could definitely bring mm -hmm. stuff in through there too. Great, thank you. Um, before I come to you, Mr. Corey, are there any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close this meeting for public comment. Uh, Mr. Corey? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to um, quote the uh, the section in the minutes uh, of July 17, 2023 of the select board. Uh, it indicated the board asked a series of questions regarding traffic and parking, as well as how deliveries would impact on these factors. Um, and the board thanked the applicant uh, and attorney Upton for their presentation. Um, and this this matter will go back. The, the board has the select board hasn't formally issued a liquor license yet. The ABC has approved it and they have and the select board has provisionally approved it. They'll only do so after um, um, the zoning board um, grants the necessary when and if the zoning board grants the necessary relief. Um, so. Um, I believe it will be that will be fully um, documented in the liquor license. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then what the board has before it, this is a an application for a special permit. Um, it's being requested under section 812B of the zoning bylaw. Um, which allows for uh, conversion of an existing non-conforming use to another non-conforming use um, by special permit, provided that the Board of Appeals finds the new use is not a substantially different use and not more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use. Um, and that first term, um, as was pointed out before, is actually defined in our bylaws. Um, that being a substantially different use, which is a use which because of its normal operation would cause readily observable differences in patronage, service, appearance, noise, employment, or similar characteristics from the use to which it is being compared. Um, and so I know we've had a, a bit of discussions sort of back and forth on, on this question. Um, I would note that in the table of uses, um, under a use that is a, uh, a dry cleaners is a personal service establishment which falls under personal consumer and business services. Um, the liquor store would be local retail of less than 3,000 square feet, which falls under the retail section. So they're in different sections of the uh, use regulations. Uh, there is no different, I had asked previously if there were any changes in the parking requirements between the two uses and was told that no, that they have the same exact parking requirements. Um, so if one could, make an argument that if there was the proper number of spaces to support a dry cleaners, there is the proper number of spaces to support um, a retail store of this nature. Um, I will say I do have some concerns about the the loading into this space. Um, and the board does have some leniency in terms of what it can condition. And I think the board um, could consider putting a limitation on the hours of uh, that deliveries could be made or specifically to prohibit them during the morning rush hour when the traffic will predominantly be on that side of Massachusetts Avenue. Um, uh, I also do have some concerns that I'm, that that's the entry to the space may or may not be um, accessible, but that is not a matter that is before this board. That is a matter for inspectional services to determine. So, um, that is not something that, that would fall under our purview. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. 
I would, I mean, as I mentioned before, I have a, some element of skepticism about whether or not this fits within as being substantially the same use um, and find solace in uh, the, pre the preceding provision, 8.1.1a. Um, I understand that not all of the members of the board uh, are as, I mean, are as comfortable with the language that I see there. The applicant is willing to rely on anything, on either one of them, if it gets them where he wants to go. And uh, uh, I feel a lot more comfortable applying the substantial, even more detrimental test as it appears in 8.1a than in the other provision. But when you really work it out, uh, it I think it comes to pretty much the same thing, and whether or not, in, in essence, whether or not the uh, the liquor store, as is proposed here, with the limitations that it has and whatever limitations we impose on it, uh, would be would or wouldn't be substantially more detrimental than the uh, than the dry cleaner that formerly existed, uh, and I would not. So. I would encourage us to continue to uh, c consider both of those provisions at least potentially applicable. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. <clears throat> so what is the best way for the board to make its determination here in regards to what seems to be the, the, the crux of the question, which is, uh, question of whether or not the use is substantially different or whether that um, is not substantially more detrimental. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. When you look at the language that Mr. Foley pointed out, um, to a considerable extent, what it's looking for are not abstractly whether something fits into one category or another, but looking at the practical effect of the uh, of one establishment compared to the practical effect of the other. So in some ways, it's a kind of a belt and suspenders argument because anything that is substantially different is likely to have at least a substantially different impact. It may not be more detrimental, but uh, it would just it would be different in some important way. Uh, and if, in fact, uh, it doesn't substantially increase traffic generation, it doesn't increase noise, it doesn't increase the various other things that are going on there, then the very same factors that would lead you to the conclusion that it wasn't substantially different would also lead you to the conclusion that it wasn't more detrimental. Um, so it seems to me that things really come down to the practical thing is, is are there characteristics of this use as it was proposed that would make it more detrimental to the neighborhood than the the dry cleaners that was that was there before. Um, and if you decide if you decide the answer to that question is no, that the impact is basically the same, then it seems to me that Mr. the definition that Mr. Hawley pointed to would also be satisfied. And if you found that it was different, and you may not know whether it was worse, just that it was a different kind of impact then you would have to ask the question of how, which of these sections apply. And I, I think that you don't get past step one here because in my view, at least, the impact is not really substantially different between the two uses. They could potentially be, I, you know, if you look at some liquor stores, they would be very different in use mm -hmm. from the average dry cleaner, but I don't think that will be as likely to be true here. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, Mr. Corey, among the things that the um, the applicants are proposing to sell their store, were they going to be selling lottery services? No, no, okay. we are um, we are uh, not doing that, and that is uh, one of the conditions of the uh, okay. of the select board's approval. I was sort of thinking of towards how people use. Um, the two stores, the, the things that would be my biggest concern sort of in changes between a you know a, a laundromat, you go in, you pick up your clothes, 
you take them home, you're not doing anything with them on the sidewalk, you're not doing anything with them um, that you'd be leaving behind on the sidewalk. Right. Whereas with a retail, that might be different. Um, but as has been stated previously, uh, sort of single use containers, uh, candy, tobacco products, I'm assuming that tobacco products would extend to vaping products would also be prohibited. Right. Um, no lottery. So a lot of those things that we sort of connotate as being things that people consume very quickly and dispose of very quickly uh, would not right. be something that would be for sale at this location. Um, and hopefully that would um, allay any concerns in regards to um, increased trash in the area. Um, we've talked a bit about the about parking. I do have my one concern about the the loading, just that I think the, the board would uh, be within its rights to state um, a prohibition on certain hours if it felt that those were important to uh, maintaining the um, uh, sort of the, the minimizing the impact of the business on the neighborhood. Um, and then uh, in regards to um, sort of the, the, the general question then as to whether this is a substantially different use, um, it seems like it would, in terms of the, the definition um, for substantially different use, um, there would not be really an observable difference necessarily in patronage, um, service appearance, noise, employment, or similar characteristics. Um, it's possible there may be more people employed, but I don't think it would be substantially different from the dry cleaners. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it would be particularly noisier than than the prior um, employment. The appearance of the building is not being proposed to be changed. Um, the prior owner had things in the window. I'm assuming this would be have things in the window. Things in the window are um, fall under the sign the sign guidelines and would have to be approved by the uh, redevelopment board under a separate permit. Um, and then it's it's really just a question of the, the service and the patronage. Um, and then it's up to the, to the members of the board to de decide if they feel that they can make a finding that the proposed use is not substantially different than the current use. I guess my question to the board would be, are there any members of the board who feel they cannot support a finding that the proposed use of as a retail store, which would fall under the guidelines as a local retail store of under 3,000 square feet, that that would, is there anyone who cannot find that that would be substantially similar to the uh, prior use, which was as a dry cleaners, which is a service use. So hearing none from the board that feel that that cannot be substantiated, then the next question would be um, the question about whether it's more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use. Um, uh, as I noted before, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Holly. Did you have something? No, I no. Um, I was just saying it. It doesn't make any substantial detrimental result. I was um, getting it. Um. Yeah. So basically, what, what I was going to say is just that the, um, you know, the the things that the applicant is allowed to sell in the store do not lead to to quick consumption, um, which would lead to loitering in the neighborhood uh, or to. Uh, an increase in the production of trash in the neighborhood. The parking counts are the same between the prior use and the current use. Um, the only change would be, I think the dry cleaners probably didn't have substantial deliveries, which this use would have. Um, and I think that the board can address that through a condition um, if it so desires. Um, one point, just the, the deliveries based on historical stores that have been opened by this tenant, they see typically three to four deliveries per week. Okay. And that the dry cleaners could have 
multiple deliveries per day when sending clothes out to other places actually do the dry cleaning. Ah, good point. Thank you. Appreciate that clarification. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then where this, uh, where this is a special permit. A question, um, um, Mr. Yes, Chair, um, on the deliveries, it is the delivery of the alcohol beverages to the store, right? Um, not the delivery to around a certain radius for the consumer, for the um, potential neighborhood. Sometimes some stores do the deliveries that um, just to clarify there. Delivery in both, well, right? Do you know if they're if they would offer delivery services? Uh, Mr. Chair, if the um, if the town were uh, willing to, I think we would like to offer that. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't um, it wouldn't result in any um, impact on traffic. The same way that mm -hmm. a delivery truck parked in front, wheeling. Uh, cases yeah. into the front door would. And certainly there's any number of delivery services today, which would already, yeah. I think, provide that service for anyone who would want it. Mm -hmm. So where this is a special permit, the board would still need to apply the special permit questions um, under section 333 in the zoning bylaw. Uh, the first is that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts. Um, I think as we had discussed that this, we do not think this would be more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use, um, which I think would also uh, allow us to conclude that the proposed use would not, uh, that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh um, it's beneficial impacts. Currently, this space is not being used um, and has not been used for a period of time. And uh, this will create a new business um, in town that will generate um, not only revenue for the town, but will uh, provide some liveliness uh, to this block and hopefully have some positive effects on some of the adjoining tenants um, who could see some increased business um, in the area. Um, the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. As we noted, this is allowed by special permit under section 812B. Uh, the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, it would be desirable to the public convenience to have a, a place where it can uh, purchase the goods that it is looking to purchase. Um, it is relatively close to um, another uh, business, but th that is more than a quarter mile away, um, which is uh, not necessarily within walking, uh, readily walking distance. Um, uh, and having a store at this location that is uh, is viable and, uh, and, uh, and lively would be certainly desirable to the public. Um, Requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Um, the only tra it, as we noted, the, the parking requirements are the same, as so there shouldn't be any additional traffic. Um, but in order to address the question of traffic congestion, that um, would recommend we discuss uh, condition. Or excuse me, in regards to uh, delivery hours, uh, rather requested use will not overload any public system. Um, this will probably have a substantially smaller energy and water footprint than the, the prior use as a as a dry cleaners. Um, so it will not overload any systems. The requested the special regulations uh, for the requested use are fulfilled. Um, there aren't any specific regulations beyond us determining the determination that it's not a substantially uh, different use and not more detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, why the requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the district. Um, although this is a residential district, being an R6, um, this is a commercial block predominantly um, with adjacent commercial businesses. Um, and so the the reuse of an existing commercial space as another commercial space will not impair the, the character or integrity of, the, of that area. 
Uh, requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. Um, so although it is a, you know, a liquor store um, selling alcohol products, um, it's been determined by the, the town and the state that this is uh, a, a type of store that the that is of benefit to the to the general welfare. As was noted, they um, during COVID this was considered an essential service, um, and the way that this is being uh, marketed where it is um, higher end and not being sold in in single use containers um, and other things which are uh, readily consumable or more desirable to um, to to people who may be underage. Um, it is uh, I do not see this as being detrimental to public health or the welfare, and the requested use will not cause an excess use uh, detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, there are two other stores um, in East Arlington, um, but they one is on Broadway and one is on the the far opposite end of um, of East Arlington, uh, <coughs> sort of the Lake Street intersection. So, uh, with that, Mr. I think Chairman? it's not an excess uh, use. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. I the one on Broadway, if if we're talking about the same one, is no longer there. The one on uh, well, on the corner of Wendt, coming of, back of, on of Broadway? Street and uh, and Broadway. Is that? I thought that was coming back once the development was finished. I didn't think it was. It could but be maybe wrong. it was. Okay. I haven't no. read the permit, so I don't know. Okay. Well, either one or two others in the in East Arlington, because there would be the 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 one that's on Massachusetts Avenue, uh, down by Marathon, and then. Um, yeah, the one Broadway in winter was the other one I was thinking of. Uh, well, some of us actually think the, the competition would be welcome, but. <laughs> um, so those are the questions under Section 333. Um, so should the board be um, disposed to approving this special permit, um, there would be the three uh, standard conditions that a board, the board would apply, which I think would still work here. Um, I'm just going to read them again, but just to confirm that they they work for this type of an application. Uh, plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector in connection with this application for zoning relief. Be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. To the building inspectors hereby notify they're to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures anytime they determine violations are present. Building inspectors shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts General Laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action, also in accordance with section 3.1. And the third is that the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, and then I would recommend it to the board um, uh, that uh, commercial deliveries shall not take place. During the hours, huh. I don't remember exactly what the hours are that the bus lane is open because um, I wanted to match that. Um, Could you just say during the hours in which the bus lane is open? That way, we're way covered if that. they change those hours. Patrick, I think he's frozen again. Oh, he's coming back. Oh, no, he's back. 
comes back. This is not my day. <laughs> One look to see if I can find the hours for the bus. Uh, way, but... I found it on Google Street View. Oh, great. Uh, it says parking lane buses only 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. 6 to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. Okay, so the condition I would propose is that commercial delivery shall not take place during the hours of 6 to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. Would that be amenable to the applicant? They would, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You seem to have lost the chair again. Yeah. So just to move us along a little bit, the next thing that the chair would normally ask is whether I would be prepared to write an opinion uh, that would support the findings that were, easy, were just discussed among us. And then I will tell him I would be happy to do that. And then he would, then he would invite or make a motion to mm -hmm. close the public hearing. Okay, I'm back again. I apologize for the difficulties I'm having with Zoom this evening. Christian, I think that we may have gotten down to the point where you invite a motion to close the public hearing, but... Well, first I would, first I would uh, ask yourself, Mr. Hanlon, whether you would prepare a decision in favor of approval yep. of the special permit request. I got us through that part. Oh, you got us through that part already. Perfect. <laughs> then yes. <laughs> Uh, then the chair would accept a motion to close the public hearing for docket 3824-232 Massachusetts Avenue. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So a roll call vote of the board responding yes or no on the motion to close the public hearing for docket 3824. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Holly. Yes. Mr. LeBlanc. Yes. Now the chair votes yes. So that is closed. Um, thank you very much to the, to the applicants for appearing this evening. Thank you, Mr. Oh, chair. chair. You're welcome. Frozen again. Oh, I'm not frozen again. Yay. Um, so just quickly for the board, uh, the next hearing is scheduled for Tuesday, November 26th. Um, Ms. Ralston, what is our, what are we looking at for the November 26th? For the 26th, we have the two that were carried over tonight. Um, oh, just we have the, only one was carried over tonight. Uh, 20, 20 Pond Lane and... No, 20 Pond Lane went to 10 December. Okay. Sorry, forgot. So we have uh, 247 Wachusets and four Interval. Um, one is a, an addition and an ADU all combined with a new garage. Um, and then the other, I believe, is just a porch. They're trying to do a porch. Um, plus then the carryover. And that is it for next week, no, the next meeting. Great. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so we're meeting on November 26th on the 10th of December, and then we don't meet again until January. So that's our the end of our year. I will note for the board. Um, oh, I see Mr. Corey has his hand up. Mr. Corey? I, I, um, just as a procedural point, has has the board voted to grant the special under 8.1.2B or 8.1.1? So the board has closed. So we... Basically, what we've done, we've closed the hearing so that we can 
uh, prepare the decision. And then at our next hearing, we will vote on the decision itself. So we have a okay. firm written decision with the conditions and everything included. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry for not making that clear. Um, so I will just note for the board, um, I will probably be late to the meeting on the 26th. Um, my nephew is having his um, uh, engagement party that evening. So, uh, but it's earlier in the evening. So hopefully I'll be available by the, at some point during the meeting. Um, so with that, unless there's anything else from the board, I'd like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout this meeting. I'd especially like to thank Colleen Ralston, Mike Champa, Mike Cunningham, and Jacqueline Munson for their assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. DuPont. Roll call vote of the board responding yes or no to adjourning Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very much. I will work on getting my Zoom more stable for next time. And uh, hope you all have a pleasant evening. No, thank, thank you very you much. much. And thank, you. thank you. Night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.